welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 402 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Ayalon, CEO of Greek University. I'm a speaker and an author. Our third book is out. It's called From Letters to Leaders, Leveraging Your Fraternity or Sorority Experience to Land Your Dream Job. So go and pick up that book today on Amazon. We call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there is nothing like great food to bring college students together. Fun fact, my son Jacob is a freshman this year as a data science major at Middle Tennessee State University. And of course, when I saw his bed set up in his room, of course, he's sleeping on the top bunk of a loft bed. And after hearing this upcoming story, you better believe I am running out right now to make a change to his sleeping arrangements to make sure that he's safe up there. But it's something that I never even thought about, which is why we're going to talk about it on the podcast today. Our next guest is Mary Ellen Jacobs. She is the founder of Rail Against the Danger and co-founder of the College Safety Coalition. She's also on staff at Shepherd Center, where her son was rehabilitated after his accident. She is a devoted mom of two and a resident of Georgia for 31 years. Her passion is to drive for lasting change in institutional bed design and college campus safety data collection. Welcome to the show, Mary Ellen. Thanks for having me, Michael. I appreciate it. Of course, what you're talking about is incredibly important. So if we can get the word out to more college students than we are doing our job today, no question. Absolutely. About it. <laughs> so Absolutely. tell us a little bit about your son, Clark. He decided to go to Georgia Tech, not too far from where I live in Nashville, Tennessee. Tell our audience, why did Clark choose Georgia Tech? Oh, it's fun. It's kind of a funny story. It's almost like a um, genetic, a ge large genetic factor in Clark's choice of colleges. My father was a aeronautical engineer at McDonnell Douglas back in the 60s. Uh, and my my husband, his father was a mechanical engineer. And then my husband for a while was also an aeronautical engineer. So we kind of jokingly said when Clark was born and when he was a little boy that um, he couldn't help it, you know, that he was kind of, he was showing signs already at two years old, he would build, like all kids do, build block towers and he would put these towers, elaborate towers together and some, eventually some part of it would fail and it would fall and he would know why. So we were like, <laughs> okay, engineer. <laughs> but naturally living in Georgia and having Georgia Tech as a public university was kind of a no-brainer for us truly. Uh, that he he could he earned a, a wonderful scholarship, a state scholarship. We have the Hope Scholarship in Georgia, and uh, it was put in place by Governor Zell Miller years ago. And if you the best one is the Zell Miller Scholarship, and he got that to go to Tech. So why wouldn't you go to Georgia Tech when you live in Georgia? Yeah, it makes total sense to me. The students there are absolutely brilliant. I love uh, going to campus and speaking there. It's just a, a great institution. And uh, yeah, it was preordained. I mean, before he was born, he knew he was going to be an engineer. It's just <laughs> what it is. Um, That's right. And so Clark went to sleep in his loft bed at Georgia Tech. This was January 9th, 2015. But he had absolutely no idea that you know, coming up the next year would be the most difficult of his life because he woke up that night. He had a headache. He didn't remember even getting out of his bunk. He was sick to his stomach. He thought he might have had the flu of all things. And he called you that afternoon. His dad brought him home from Georgia Tech. He had a terrible headache. He couldn't turn his neck. So that's interesting. And by Sunday morning, all of a sudden, now he's becoming sensitive to light and his headache was getting even worse. So at that point, as Clark's mom, what are you thinking at this moment? It was so, okay, first of all, it was it was a real head scratcher. Like you said, we, we were looking at him and examining him when he came home and asking him questions. And uh, being that, like you had alluded to the fact when you saw your, your son's bunk, you were horrified. And I was much the same way when I saw Clark moved into a beautiful brand new fraternity house that year. He had lived a whole year in the dormitory on a, on a bunk bed, you know, top bunk had never had any incident at all. So we go look at this brand new room. It's a beautiful fraternity house, 50 beds that are all about seven feet off the floor. And underneath the bed, it's like built into the wall. So the, underneath the bed is the chest of drawers and the desk and the closet, the living space. My son is six foot five and could walk under the bed. So that gives you an idea how, how high up this thing was. Mm -hmm. So I see this thing and I'm horrified. I'm like, where's, you know, oh my God, what if you fall out of that? And he's like, mom, and him and my daughter, his older sister and my um, 
my husband all kind of chuckled and said, he's not going to fall out of his bed. And, and of course, I'm trying to not be that mom, you know, that helicopter mom that he didn't trying to let him go, trying to give him a little, little more umbilical cord <laughs> to, <laughs> to, um, to pull away from the parents. And um, so I, I relented. I didn't go further with that conversation. And gosh, I wish now I had. But um, we, I said, do you think you might have fallen out of your bed? And he said, why would you say that? And I said, I don't know. You've got a terrible headache. You're sick to your stomach. Um, you had a meningitis shot, so I don't think you have meningitis. So we decided to take him to the hospital. And sure enough, the first thing the, the ER doctor wanted to do was give him a spinal tap because he suspected he did not present like a head injury at all. Um, so they did. CT scans and realized that he had a pretty significant skull fracture in, in the back of his skull, bad enough that the ER doctor said he either fell out of bed and landed on his head, or he was cracked in the head with a, a crowbar. And we said, well, we know that didn't happen. So um, we did, deducted that he had fallen out of his bed. And he did say at that point, he said, you know, my bunk, he had like blackout curtains on his, his bed. Mm -hmm. And he said they were on the floor. So I have a feeling that he started to roll over thinking the bed was there. He had one of those mattress pads and those are, those can be kind of slippery. And I think he thought the bed was there, rolled off and grabbed those curtains on the way down. Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. I mean, there was a chance that Clark would not survive this. I mean, Clark spent oh, the next two and a half months. He was fighting for his life. He was minimally conscious. He had infections. He had blood clots. Clark doesn't remember any of this. He doesn't remember no. falling. He doesn't remember waking up. He doesn't remember going to the hospital. He doesn't remember doing inpatient therapy at Shepherd Center. He only remembers being at home four months later doing physical therapy and talking to you about how unbelievably common this type of an accident is. And he, apparently 71,000 kids per year are injured in bunk and loft beds. I mean, that goes from the little kids all the way through college, all the way through the military, et cetera, et cetera. This is totally 100% preventable. So why is this issue not a bigger priority for colleges and universities? That is such a good question, Michael. I, I agree. I, I feel like it should be priority, especially with those kind of numbers. Um, so as I started down this down this uh, process, through this process of, of trying to find out, A, how often it happened and finding that horrible number, um, then I kind of started looking into our own state system. The state of Georgia has a uh, public university system called the University System of Georgia. It consists of 26 schools. So I was able to, through a friend of mine, met with um, the Board of Regents. And I bet there were probably seven to eight people in the room. Uh, that were part of facilities management, things like that for the um, university system. And I started asking questions like, do you have a bunk bed policy? Is there a, are safety rails offered at any schools? Are they required? Are they not required? All these kind of questions. Because even though Clark was injured in a fraternity house, which is private, I still wanted to know how common this was and why there wasn't more of a policy involved any, on any campus. And sure enough, there really wasn't a consistent cohesive policy that existed across those schools. So they agreed to do a survey. They um, surveyed all the schools, found out that there were quite a few of them, I think six or seven that had bunk beds and loft beds that didn't offer anything. Then there were other ones that had them but didn't require them and things like that. So they required that across, this was in 2017, they required across the board that the school system had to have rails to offer. Of course, for me as a mom, knowing college students, that's not enough. Um, college students on their own, 18 year old, 18 year olds are not going to walk into a room and go, gosh, I wonder if I need a safety rail. That's not the first thing in their mind. That's, they certainly don't want to be different than the other guy. So if the, if the rail's not already on the bed, they don't want to be that kid that asks for a safety rail. Mm -hmm. So my contention was why not start with the safety being the default? So Clark and I did 11 uh, of the summer of 17, after this rail policy had gone to place for having the rails in the housing offices, we did uh, 11 facet, which is what their freshman orientations are called. We did 11 freshman orientations. And we had a table set up with, with information on how to get your safety rail through housing. We had a big scary banner of Clark that showed him with all the tubes and wires after his brain surgery that he almost passed away during. 
and then a picture of a bunk bed and said, um, I think the, the line was something along the lines of, think you're too cool for a safety rail, don't fall for that. Because I still feel like the kids don't know. I think if they really saw my son's story, we've got a pretty compelling video on our website. I think if they saw, really saw what Clark went through for the lack of a simple safety rail and how it's affected his life, they would, they would get one in yeah. a second. 100% agree with that. I mean, finally, he returns to Georgia Tech now in August of 2016, 19 months after uh, his loft bed fall. He graduated in the summer of 2020. What was it like for you as a parent to see Clark graduate from Georgia Tech? Oh, my gosh. I'll tell you what. Before he was injured, I would say Clark was a – he had a straight A thing going at Georgia Tech. Very brilliant kid. Very smart. And – he still had that intelligence miraculously uh, after this fall and the brain bleed and everything, but everything was much harder. Uh, there, the things that did occur and did that are lasting with my son are short-term memory loss, um, weakness on his left side from the stroke, um, even just a, I, he had to take it a lot slower when he went back. His brain, I would say even here, eight and a half years later, his brain is still healing. And we're still seeing recovery even this this much later. But he went back to school, and that's all he ever wanted was to get back to Georgia Tech. So when he walked onto that campus under his own power and went back to school, that was a that was that to him, I think, August 10th, 2016 is the proudest. That's his proud moment. The graduation part, he was, of course, very excited he graduated, but he wasn't nearly, I think I wanted that. It was the middle of COVID. I'm like, you mean, what do you mean? We're not going to have a, a ceremony and he gets to walk across the stage. I was like, so I was like, I want that mama. So we end up um, going through, we, we do get the word. And I think it was August after he'd already graduated, we did get the word that he would be able to walk in the December ceremony. So we ended up having a beautiful, I think it was December 11th, 2020, beautiful day, uh, nice, crisp, but not cold weather. And we sat there in the stands with masks on and watched our son walk across that stage. And I can tell you, I cheered louder for that than I ever did for straight A's. Yeah. He, um, had, he struggled to get, get that, that degree, but he did it. Mm, that's really, really good news. What can our listeners do today to support and pass what's called the Corey Safety Act of 2023? What is that Safety Act and what can our audience do in order to support it? Absolutely. So at, during this process, in fact, it was in 2020, I was actually approached via email by another parent who had sadly, uh, tragically lost her son on a, uh, to a preventable accident on campus out at um, University of Colorado Boulder. He was uh, traveling across campus, brand new student, 15 days into his freshman year. And he was on a skateboard, very good skateboarder, very, um, you know, very, very experienced. And um, he came across a pathway that he didn't realize was not great for skateboards. There was no sign that said dismount. There was no one to tell him that he shouldn't go down the pathway. He went down a pathway, hit a bad spot and flew off of his skateboard and had a terrible brain injury and passed away six hours in a hospital. Um, so his mother reached out to me because she had kind of, when she, she and her husband went to, to get their son's belongings and check him out of university, they realized that he was the third death in 15 days at that school. Oh. Third student death. So she, when she contacted me, she was already formulating in her brain this um, this idea for a bill that would require colleges to count and record into a, re a usable data set this missing these missing numbers from eighteen to twenty five. They call it the data desert because there's really very little information or uh, data that we can use to to point to these safety gaps on campuses. So it's it's kind of like, I always say, if, if you don't know it's broke, how can you fix it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's kind of what it's like, because if you don't have, everything in our society runs on data, everything. If you want to get money uh, funding for something, you've got to show the data of why you need that funding. If you're a doctor and you're trying to, you know, do some experimental procedure, you've got to show the data that makes that happen. Mm -hmm. So all we're asking for is that the Clary Act 
which was, uh, I think that was in the late 90s, the, the Clary's, um, they were a couple of brokenhearted parents whose daughter had been assaulted and uh, murdered in her dormitory in Lehigh University. And they realized upon looking a little further into her death that there was a lot of crime around that area that no one knew about. Lots of accidents, lots of crime. And so they started a, they got a bill passed that required crimes and fires to be reported by schools. So every campus in this country is required, if they get any any funding from the United States government, they are required to report in their security report their crimes and fires on campus. That data in turn is available for parents and students to look at. Hey, I wanna to go to this university. What's their crime statistics like? We want that same thing for accidents that occur on campus. Yeah. That we can, because not only is it gonna keep students safer and it's gonna prevent accidents because we're gonna be able to look at that problematic pathway that by the way, five years later is still not fixed. And we can say, oh my gosh, we've had four students injured on that pathway. Let's fix that pathway. Right. Or we've got this blind intersection where bushes are growing into the intersection and we've had several pedestrian accidents. Let's let's fix that intersection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, I'm starting to see some states introduce bills like if we talk about like hazing deaths, for example, or hazing cases that some states are requiring the universities to publish that information by organization. So that way parents and their children can decide which fraternity is best for their son based on that data. But it's like individual states. I mean, there's nothing that, you know, countrywide. Uh, we are implementing in order to make better choices. And I think that's really important because, you know, that is basically uh, a great way to keep the organizations accountable and the universities accountable to making sure that the, the students are safe and let's make decisions accordingly, you know, with data. Absolutely. So, and not um, only is it this, think of where we spend, we spend a lot of money on college. Now this has my heart and my son's accent, I don't, I, I would do move heaven and earth and spend any amount of money. But I'm talking about when you are getting ready to spend those massive education dollars, you should be able to make an informed decision with yes. that money. Yeah, there's an expression in our industry, we say sunlight is the best disinfectant. Uh, and I think, <laughs> you know, really, this that's what we're That's doing. true. It's yes. true. I mean, it's just 100% true. And I think in this case, you know, protecting children uh, who are up on these bunk beds, sunlight is the best disinfectant. It really Absolutely. Really is. Common uh, sense, right? Common sense stuff. I mean, really, uh, is it, other than the Corey Safety Act of 2023, is there anything else that we should be doing in order to fight for children's safety? Well, I'll tell you what, um, even with the Rail Against the Danger effort, uh, my efforts have mainly been aimed at, you know, public universities and even the Corey Act as public universities. Right. Um, and by and large, unfortunately, public universities don't have a lot of say so in Greek organizations. So if I were a fraternity or a sorority out there right now, I would be looking at your current housing um, situation. Like Michael said, he was a little scared when he saw his sons. I think we should be able to look at those at those facts. Do you have safety rails on your beds? You should. Right. Um, do you because I know that deep down inside you don't want any one of your brothers or sisters to be hurt. You would never wish something like Clark's accident on them. My, Clark's fraternity was Kappa Sigma. Mm -hmm. The minute this happened to Clark, they realized Clark's was about the third or fourth fall in that brand new fraternity house. His was the worst accident, but um, they went ahead and put safety rails on all the beds. Yeah. So, And then a couple of fraternities that were close by and heard about Clark, they did the same thing. But there's, it's, it's just to me, like you said, Michael, this is such a preventable thing. And I will also say this not to be, um, to scare anybody or to put this in your, but just put this in your, in your, uh, the back of your mind that fraternities and sororities are also, you could be sued yeah. uh, no pretty easily by, yeah. uh, by a, a parent who had a child. If my son would not have recovered, um, to the point that he was able to, if we would have been looking at lifetime nursing home care for my son, I would have had to have sued. Yeah, no question I wouldn't about want it. to do it, but mm -hmm. you know, it, we have to, you have to look at the liability in a situation like this and is, you can make them as pretty as you want. You can have a, you know, you can do something with your fraternity crest on it. You could do all kinds of things, but uh, just protect your, your brothers and sisters. It's, it's such a, 
an easy thing to do and it can be so terribly tragic if you don't. Yeah, there's definitely liability there. Uh, you know, I'm very good friends with a lot of the executive directors, including Kappa Sigma. Uh, Mick Wilson is a great guy. Um, and so I think I'll get you connected after the show with some of the executive directors and some of their training. So that way we can get the word out to all the fraternities and sororities, because I do believe there is liability there. And I think this story will compel them to act within all of their organizations as well. So I think there's definitely some follow-up work that you and I can do together uh, to help um, is there any other research? I mean, you've been at this for a while. Is there any other research that you've uncovered that relate to this other than the 71,000 kids per year that are injured in these bunk and loft beds? I think one of the biggest hurdles we encountered with the Corey Safety Act was trying to, um, I think the current uh, classification of falls was kind of problematic because uh, there's language in, in hospitals and in uh Data, re data collection where it's like slips and falls or falls from heights. Well, bunk beds fall somewhere in, it's not a slip of It is a fall from a height, but it's not like a 20 foot height. It's a six to seven foot height. height. So um, we had to kind of do our own research and we found a, a study that showed that had kind of a less than uh, one meter one meter to six meters, over six meters. So, because what I wanted selfishly with the Corey Act, the Corey Act does cover all kinds of incidents and accidents, not just bunk bed things, it's all kinds of uh, reasons for, uh, you know, injuries and deaths on campus. But one of my, selfishly, I wanted something that showed that, that, that height. That, that I can harness because that's the thing that frustrated me the most in my in my search is I could find these terrible ER numbers, but I couldn't find anything that showed where those numbers came from. Mm -hmm. So if these if these incidents and accidents are reported and recorded, we can use that to say, look, this is how many people are falling that could be prevented. And I think that the schools I'll be bold to say I'm pretty sure the schools are pretty aware of, of the problem. I know it's expensive uh, yep. to fix. Georgia Tech spent probably a quarter of a million dollars on retrofitting their beds uh, the year that they re became required in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what? A quarter of a million dollars in a college budget, that's not that much. No, it's not that much. And there's huge. Let's, let's talk about how much we spend on football. Right. <laughs> right. Know, yeah. Well, that's a whole football, other conversation. <laughs> I love football, but let's, <laughs> let's, you know, look at, let's, you know, make the kids safe first or yeah. they're not going to be able to play football. That's right. No, we got to make them safer. There's a lot of liability there. And uh, if one student gets hurt, there's your 250,000 easy. Uh, so, all right. Well, listen, I think we've done some good work here and I'll connect you to some of the fraternity and sorority executives. So that way you can get in front of them and talk to them a little bit more about this issue. Um, and you know what, we're not all that far away from each other, you know, me being here in Nashville and I do that's love right. good food. I mean, you know, for me, that's my weakness. It's just really Ooh, good. Food. Me too. So are there any good food spots that I need to know about near Ackworth, Georgia? <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I'll tell you what, we have some, we have, I think real Atlanta is a very eclectic uh, area for food. Mm -hmm. We have mm -hmm. lots of, I, if there's one thing the South is kind of known for, I would say barbecue. Oh, yeah. So we've got some good barbecue down here, but we've got a lot of, I'm a, I'm a sushi girl. Oh, wow. Sushi. I love okay. sushi. Yeah. I know. I know. Right. A little scary. <laughs> you gotta be very particular about your sushi when you don't live on the coast, but right. uh, but we have got really pockets all over Georgia of really, really good food, Italian food, just um, specifically, there's a place near me, if I drop a name for yeah. the sushi, it's called sushi Sushiology, like sociology only, sociology. sociology. Ooh, really, really good. That's my daughter's and mine latest find. We are sushi girls. I love it. I love it. I'm a big fan too. It's just, yeah, I mean, being landlocked here in Nashville, um, I used to live on the water in New York in Long Island. And uh, so we had access to really, really good sushi, but like, I'm nervous eating it here in Nashville because I'm like, how far did that sushi how have to travel far? to get exactly. here? Exactly. <laughs> in New York, my gosh, I when I went to New York several times for the US Open, I'm a tennis yeah. player and I was astounded at any little place you would stop in. Fantastic. in the city 
Yeah. The food was amazing. Amazing. Like I walked into like a, it was like a Murphy's or some kind of Irish pub. And I said, is there any way you could make me like just a big salad with some grilled salmon on top? They said, sure. One of the best salmon salads I ever had in my life. <laughs> yeah. I, listen, I was born in New York City, so I was really spoiled with great food. I mean, you got Little Italy over there. You got Chinatown. I mean, you oh. have, I mean, access to, to food like that's just like the best in the world. And it's like. You know, I love Nashville and this is definitely home now, but every time I get to go back, I'm like, oh, I know I'm going to gain at least 20 pounds here. <laughs> it's so oh, bad. bad. <laughs> but it's all good. It's all good. All right. Well, listen, this is a lot of fun and uh, we learned a lot today, which is the most important thing. If our listeners, if they want more information um, about your organization, uh, Rail Against the Danger, or they want to get involved with the Corey Safety Act of 2023 and promote that, where can they go to get involved with all of this? Tell you what, you can, several different areas of, of our webs, our web, uh, I can't even talk, our websites for both the College Safety Coalition.net uh -huh. okay. and railagainstthedanger.org both have a, information and a place for you to jump off there to go to our you join website and get your name behind this. It will literally take you less than two minutes. We have a pre-written letter. As soon as you put your name and address and email into that form, it knows exactly who your senators are and who your U.S. representative is. Nice. And, and within two minutes, you got a letter flying off to Washington saying that you're behind this. So if you could do that for us, that would be fantastic. And again, you can find that at either the college safe, college safety coalition net or railagainstthedanger.org. I love it. All right. So railagainstthedanger.org. Go and check that out. Make sure that you write to your representatives to make sure that this becomes the standard in the industry in terms of beds. Um, and what can I say, Mary Ellen, thank you so much for sharing all of this critical information with us today. It's incredibly important what you do. And thank you. Thank you, Michael. You as well. Thank you for doing Greek University. I think the more we can inform our students and keep them safe, the more they can achieve their dreams. Amen. From your lips to God's ears. Uh, so <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you to our listeners. Thank you for, uh, for hanging out with us today. If you found that Mary Ellen's information is important, what I want you to do is like this on social media. Make sure that you share it with other fraternity members, sorority members, other college students, uh, so that way we can all get involved in this important cause. And we look forward to seeing you on another episode of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us today. We'll see you next time. 